Hi, I'm Tom. I'm at Wesleyan University in All Outwater Laboratories. And I'm having a beer. Um, I'm here because I'd like to know more about yeast, which is a key ingredient in beer. Uh, it also turns out to be a key ingredient in the research of professors Scott Holmes and Mark Flory. My name is Mark Flory. I'm an assistant professor here in the Molecular Biology and Biochemistry Department. Uh, I've been here for about two years now um, and study uh, in broad sweep the mechanisms of chromosome segregation in eukaryotic cells as a model system. We use uh, small yeast known as fission yeast, very different than budding yeast, uh, but we study the mechanisms by which these cells segregate their chromosomes normally, but we're also interested in mechanisms that can go awry, and these, this, these studies have potentially have a lot of implications for cancer in the process of carcinogenesis. So, uh, so you also brew beer? <laughs> yes. Well, the first thing to do is uh, gather the materials. So I have a, now I used to use an enamel pot, uh, large pot that was is typically used for canning vegetables and so forth. Those are brittle and they chip easily, although they do work if you keep them intact. I've now got a nice steel kettle with a tap on the bottom. There's large volumes of hot, boiling hot liquids that are being transferred, so it's nice to not have to try to move those around and spill them on the dog and stuff. Um, so it usually takes a big pot. Uh, to do the simplest kind of uh, beer brewing, usually you just have sort of a molasses-like extract. Uh, you uh, dissolve this in water, uh, boiling water. You may adjust the pH, the acidity, the basicity of the water a little bit. Um, uh, you boil this up. Sometimes you add a muslin bag of grains to, to get a little extraction of some sugars and, and so forth from the grains. Uh, at various intervals through what's usually about a 90 minute uh, boiling period, you add hops in bags and so forth, so you're adding these various ingredients for some things like a pumpkin ale, I add spices like coriander and uh, allspice and so forth, and it really depends on the beer. At the end, um, you use, there's a myriad of cooling devices, but one is just a simple heat exchanger to cool the wort down, the wort is the liquid, resulting liquid. You want to snap cool it because you don't want it to have a gradual cooling off because that can sort of overcook things. Um, and then you transfer it to either a plastic or a large glass carboy vessel and add a culture of yeast. So sometimes we, I actually grow them here. Uh, you can buy now very good cultures of yeast in the store and you just actually mix them on a, on a somewhat warm surface overnight and the bag expands indicating the CO2 is being produced and you add that. That goes for about you know anywhere from three days to a week and you can actually see vigorous bubbling and by then it's fermented out usually can add some secondary ingredients if you don't want them to be processed during the fermentation um, or you can just simply transfer it to a new container so that it cl continues clarifying and settling um, and then usually the process is to let that sit for a while they generally do become better with age you have them sealed completely and protected from light um, and then you either put them in bottles or people often have little keg systems where they have soda kegs by I usually do five gallon batches and you have a little CO2 tank and a little soda keg set up and it's much easier than cleaning bottles and filling them. So you add that to the keg system and uh, carbonate overnight and then it's ready to go. So yeast isn't simply an ingredient in beer anymore. It's crucial in cancer research. My name is Scott Holmes. Uh, I study broadly, I study the control of gene expression and we're particularly interested in the influence that the structure of a chromosome has on whether genes get turned on and off. So we know that the chromosome is this big long piece of DNA. Everybody's familiar with the idea of DNA as the blueprint or um, the, the genetic code and it's this, this long sequence of G's, A's, T's, C's. So the the context in which we're studying all these things is, uh, is yeast cells, so the species Saccharomyces cerevisiae, so known as brewer's yeast or baker's yeast, it's the same yeast you would find in your kitchen to break your bread or in, in, if you were a brewer to use to make the beer. It's, uh, it's sometimes called the world's oldest domesticated organisms, the first organism that humans put to their own use. 
Uh, it's proven to be a great model system because of centuries, mostly in the brewing industry, <coughs> there's lots of uh, strains of particular types of this one species were well developed and were characterized. And the genetics was pretty well characterized, again, because of the commercial uh, importance of the yeast. So around, you know, in the middle part of the 20th century, uh, people started grabbing that yeast out of the commercial venue and putting it into academic labs and started studying it for its own right. And it's proven to be, for some, because of those long history, but also just because of fortuitous circumstances, it's proved to be a great organism. It's very uh, easy to manipulate the genome. Once we found the DNA came around, it proved to be you know, a tremendous organism in terms of using the kind of ways we can manipulate genes, uh, change genes, introduce lead genes, uh, really flex flexible and plastic organism to do those kinds of things. The second reason uh, people use it is it's a great model system. So people st will study this kind of any organism because of its own intrinsic interest because we want to know about biology, but often we, we call these things model organisms and we hope that their model is what we find in them is going to be true for uh, many forms of life, including us. Right. So another advantage over lots of other model systems is how fast you can grow these yeast. So the, the so-called doubling time in optimal conditions is about an hour and a half, about 90 minutes for to, to, to double. And because you guys know about exponentials, I can start with a few cells one day and the next day I've got millions and millions of cells to do whatever I want with. If I want to, if I create, the, create this great strain of yeast that's got all, a lot of genetic manipulations that are designed to do a particular experiment and I feel like I'm going on vacation, I can freeze that yeast cell down in the minus 80 freezer, I can go away for a year, come back, streak it out. Once you make a mouse that you really want, you're, you're stuck with propagating that mouse uh, forever basically. The same is true as even for a model system like Drosophila, you can't freeze a fly down. Once you make a genetic stock that you want, you're, you're stuck with breeding that fly forever, basically. So you can just like go in your lab right now and take some of the yeast that you have in the freezer and use it to brew beer? You, you could, you wouldn't you want to use, <laughs> so, so you wouldn't want to use any of our strains to brew beer because you probably wouldn't get a good product out of it. I mean, they're really, the, there's enough differences. I mean, it's the same species. You could probably, you know, cross them into the uh, brewing industry yeast. But uh, but if you're going to brew beer, it's it's a, again, it's a different strain. It's a different background. They were selected for different properties, uh, high alcohol tolerance, lots of things. Uh, and our ours were selected for ease of use in the lab. And those things sometimes don't aren't in parallel.